This morning I'm continuing the message series called The High Cost of Living. And I'm not talking about the inflation rate. I'm talking about the stress rate that we carry day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. Life is filled with stressors that place us under pressure and tension. We have genuine concerns about people, places, and possessions. And the bad news is that these stressors and concerns can lead us down the negative highway called stress, fear, and worry. A costly way to live. But God doesn't want us to live with stress. God wants us to experience His peace in His presence even in the middle of our stressors. Now, we can't control the stressors that may come our way, but we can control whether or not we allow those stressors to lead us to stress. And by learning to trust our loving, wise, and powerful Heavenly Father, we can replace stress with peace. We can experience the abundant life rather than the anxious life. So for the next four Sundays, I want us to focus on four major stressors that people experience throughout their life so that we can no longer feel squeezed by those particular things. So our goal is to take a look at what the Bible says about each of these stressors so that we can no longer allow these stressors to lead us to the point of stress, fear, and worry. In other words, the Bible is going to share with us some action steps that we can take to remove stress from our life. We're always going to have stressors, but we don't have to allow the stressors to lead us to the high cost of a stressful life. We can experience instead God's peace and God's presence even in our stressors. So this morning, I want us to begin by talking about life's biggest stressor. And this stressor just so happens to be everybody's favorite subject. We're going to talk about money. <laughs> yes, we're going to think carefully about the subject stress in my budget. Now, according to the American Society of Stress, in their 2020 report, 64% of people say that money is a major source of stress in their life. And that number jumps to 73% for Americans with a household income under $50,000. And that's important because 40% of American households fit into that category. Now, studies have shown that financial stress among couples is by far the biggest predictor of whether or not they will stay married. Many young couples through debt try to accumulate in three years what their parents accumulated in 30 years. Then at the end of the month, there's this heated conflict when there's not enough money to pay the bills and there's no money left over for entertainment. Personal debt is the number one relationship killer. Many couples pay their debts with their marriage rather than their checkbook. Perhaps we should change the marriage vows from till death do us part to till debt do us part. I read a story about a woman who's talking about her husband, who she calls the tightest man I've ever known. And throughout this man's life, every time he received a paycheck, he would take $20 out of that paycheck and hide it under his mattress. And he did this year after year after year. And finally, after many years, the man gets sick and he's on his deathbed. And as the man is dying, he says to his wife, I want you to promise me something. I want you to promise that when I die, that you're going to take all of my money from under that mattress and place it in my casket 
so that I can take it all with me. And the wife agrees to honor her husband's dying request. Well, the man passes away and the wife keeps her promise. On the day her husband dies, the wife goes in to the bedroom and gathers all the money from under that mattress. Then she takes all of that money to the bank and she deposits it into her account. Then she writes her dead husband a check and places it in his casket. Why are people so stressed about money? Why is money such a significant stressor? Well, I believe the Bible can help us answer some of those questions. So if you have your Bible today, I invite you to open it to the New Testament letter called 1 Timothy. The Apostle Paul writes to his protege, Timothy, and he gives him some really sound advice about money and how to keep money from becoming a major stressor in your life. And he does this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, and then in verses 17 through 19. So let's begin in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Paul talks in these verses about four action steps that we can take so that we no longer feel squeezed and pressured by stress in our budget. Number one, practice contentment. Paul says in verse six, godliness with contentment is great gain. So if we're content with our finances, then the major stressor of money will have no power to dominate our life. If we live with contentment, then we're not living with stress. But how many people are content with their money? Vance Pittman points out that money is such a major stressor because we have the wrong understanding of contentment. Now, our culture has led us to believe that contentment is found in getting everything we've ever wanted. Most people believe that I'll be content as soon as I have or have access to all the things that I desire. When I finally have all of my desires fulfilled, then I will be content. The Apostle Paul offers a different definition of contentment in verse 8. Paul writes, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. So for Paul, contentment is not about getting everything we want. It's about getting our needs met. If I have everything I need to survive, then I will live with contentment. Now, here's the reality. If I base my contentment upon getting my needs met, then I can live with contentment almost every day of my life. I have what I need to survive so I can be content and not be stressed. 
But if I base my contentment upon getting everything I want in life, then I will experience contentment almost zero days of my life. I mean, there's always something out there that I still want. So I'm not content with what I have today. And if I'm not content, then I'm living with stress. Now, there's nothing wrong with pursuing a better life and seeking to better our standard of living. There's nothing wrong with that. But we just have to do it in the right way. So if I'm content with what I have today, chances are I'll be content tomorrow if I have a little bit more or even if I have a little bit less. But if I'm not content with what I have today, chances are I won't be content tomorrow, even if I have more. There's a Russian proverb that states, money is like seawater. The more you drink, the thirstier you get. So how much money does it take to be content? John D. Rockefeller said, I have made many millions but they have brought me no happiness. Contentment is a choice. Choose to be content. Listen to what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. You have a choice. You can live with contentment and peace, or you can live with discontentment and stress. Number two, place God at the center. Paul warns in verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Then Paul advises in verse 17 to put your hope in God who richly provides you with everything for your enjoyment. So you have a choice to make about who or what is going to be the center of your life. Jesus talks about this choice in Matthew chapter 6, Verse 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Money is a test. It reveals the true center of your life. Jesus views money as God's number one competitor for your heart. Your life can be about your God or your life can be about your money. Some people get their identity from their money. They identify themselves by what they have or by what they don't have. And for these people, they always need the newest car the latest technology, the biggest and the best of everything. They think about money all the time. They talk about money all the time. They live for money. They're consumed by money. They love money and have money at the center of their existence. But Paul says it's much better, it's a better choice to put God at the center of your life. Instead of putting your trust in riches, you should put your hope in your living God. God can provide far more security than any earthly investment. And God isn't stingy. He richly provides us with all that we need. He supplies our needs and He even gives us more than we actually need. So instead of putting your hope in your money, put your hope in your loving, wise, and powerful Heavenly Father. People with wealth at the center of their life 
experience a whole lot of stress. I mean, the more you have, the more you could lose. Money is so uncertain, it could be gone to, d today. You could have it today, but it could be gone tomorrow. Almost everybody lost money in the stock market last year. But people with God at the center of their life experience so much more peace. They trust God to take care of them. And they become content with God's blessings. God is certain. Money comes and goes, but God never goes away. These people have learned to love God, love people, and use things. They know the danger of loving things and using God and people. You have a choice. You can put God at the center of your life and live with contentment and peace. Or you can put money at the center of your life and live with stress. Number three, plan your contribution. Paul writes in verse 18, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Money is intended to be a tool to accomplish a greater goal. Money was never intended to be an end in itself. So we have to wrestle with this question. Do I want more stuff? Or do I want to help more people and do more to support God's work? Corey Ten Boom writes, The measure of life is not in its duration, but in its donation. True riches are found in what we give, not in what we keep. If we want to be rich, then we should not seek to be rich with money, but we should seek to be rich in doing good for other people. The more you have, the more opportunity you have to do good. When you have extra of something, you have an opportunity to do good with that. Many have observed that the more money people make, the less they're willing to give away on a percentage basis. Why is that? People who live for money don't want to part with it. They find it stressful to give away their money and let somebody or someone else have it. I mean, if your life is all about accumulating wealth, the last thing you want to do is give it away. Someone has written that there are three kinds of givers. The flint, the sponge, and the honeycomb. In order to get anything out of a flint, you have to hammer it. And even when you do, you only get just a little bit of, of chips and some sparks. To get water out of a sponge, you have to squeeze it. And the more you squeeze it, the more water you get. But the honeycomb just overflows with sweetness. So what kind of giver are you? Paul states in verse 19 that people who contribute to God's work are laying up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. When you give to God's work, you're making an investment in an eternal treasure. You see, when you view your money from the lens of eternity, you lose your grip on money, and money loses its grip on you. You don't get credit for what you keep. You only get credit for what you give away. And so if you want to be rich toward God, you've got to learn to be generous when it comes to contributing to God's work. So you have a choice. You can use your money as a contribution and live with peace and for eternity, or you can use all your money for yourself and live with stress and one day leave it all behind 
for your family to fight over. (laughs) Number four, prepare your money chart. Paul talks in verse 19 about laying hold of the life that is truly life. Now, you can manage your money in such a way that it leads to stress, worry, and misery. Or you can manage your money in such a way that it leads to peace, contentment, and contribution. Money can lead you to a life of anxiety or money can lead you to a life of abundance. The me first money chart is best explained this way. On payday, you spend as much as you desire on you as part of your living expenses. And you just put away just a little bit for savings. And then finally, you give to God and you give to other people if and only if there's money left over at the end of the month. Now, this me first money chart is guaranteed to cause stress in your life because you're going to spend so much on you that you have little put away for savings and you give almost nothing to God and other people. And your stress can become catastrophic if you start spending more than you make each month. That's called debt, and debt produces big-time stress. Well, the God-first money chart is best explained this way. On payday, you set aside the money that you're going to give to God first. So on payday, the first check that you write is to God. And many Christians practice what's called tithing which is giving God 10% off the top. Then you set aside another 10% for savings, for both the short term and the long term. And then finally, you live off the remaining 80%. You live off the 80% that is left, not 90%, not 100%, and certainly not 110%. The 10-10-80 money chart will help you eliminate almost all of your stresses about money. If you follow it, you're making an investment every payday in God's work, and that yields eternal dividends. You've got money saved up for the short term and the long term, which helps eliminate the stress that comes from those unexpected expenses. And you're being disciplined to live on what you have left over. And by eliminating unnecessary debt, you are eliminating unnecessary stress. If your financial situation is off track and you are absolutely stressed when it comes to your money, your heavenly Father is saying to you, put me in charge of your finances and watch what I can do. Put me first when it comes to your money. Follow the 10, 10, 80 chart and watch the blessings come your way. Fund my kingdom first and I'll take care of you and lead you to a place of financial security and peace. Give me all of your money stressors and I'll lead you away from money stress and toward money freedom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have a plan. Father, we live in a world today where so many are stressed about money. 
And Father, our economic situation, the inflation rate has really made matters more difficult for so many people. Father, for many today, money is tight. For many today, they're just trying to get by. But Father, you have a plan. And your plan is to put you first and to trust you. Father, I know that thousands of thousands of stories can be told about people who put you in charge of their money, and now they are doing incredible. (laughs) Father, you are a great money manager. You know what to do. You are smarter than any money manager out there. And Father, may we trust you with our money so that instead of becoming a matter of stress, it can become a matter of peace. It can be a matter of contentment and a matter of contribution. Father, we trust you with our soul. Teach us to to trust you with our money, with our finances. Father, may we not live in stress when it comes to money, but instead, may we experience your peace and your presence as you teach us how to manage money your way. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.